All right, welcome back. Shh, okay. Uh, please sign into the attendance if you can. Uh, we are today at class 14, which is basically the halfway point of the semester. Um, in class on Thursday, I'll talk about the exam uh, slash midterm. Um, I have too much to cover today. I can't do it today, but Thursday is a little bit lighter of a, of a, of a topic. Uh, so I want to talk about that on Thursday. Um, I want to make a brief note that we had a, we had a workshop last week um, where the president of Barbary came back to the faculty. And he was talking about one of the components of the bar called the MPT, uh, which is the multi-state performance test. This is one we have to actually write something. You have to write a memo. You have to write a closing argument. You have to write a letter. You have to write something. It's not multiple choice or fill in. And um, he gave one piece of advice that I want to pass on to you. Um, one of the biggest reasons people fail is they don't finish. And that might sound obvious, of course. If you don't finish, you can't pass, right? But let me give you a little bit more evidence, right? Let's say you have two questions and two hours. And each question is weighted equally. How much time should you put to each question? One hour. What happens if you get to an hour and you're not done with question one? What do you do? Go to question two. That sounds really obvious, right? How many of our students spend 90 minutes on question one and then scramble for 30 minutes in question two? A lot of the failures. They panic, they don't look at their watch, they forget. So I know this sounds super obvious, but I can tell you on my exam, right, there are 10 questions. They're all weighted equally. I can't tell you how many people do really well number one, two is okay, and they get down to the bottom, they're really crappy. Why? Because they rushed, they ran out of time. So I will give you the same general advice from my exam for the bar. Count your minutes. If you have 10 questions and you have three hours, right? Each question is weighted equally. Give the same number of minutes for each question. On my exam, it's at 10 to 12 minutes per question, depending how fast you read, right? If you spend 20 minutes in question one, you're not going to finish. You'll leave number five blank, or you just won't even give a good answer. I can tell, right? When people leave the end of their exam blank, I know they ran out of time. So you're saying, oh, of course, Josh, it's obvious. Even in this you know, 1L class where you're just, um, my tripod's too close. In this 1L class where you're just you know, getting started, people already start developing habits where they <laughs> spent all their time in the first question and they can't finish, OK? So I hope none of you put a blank answer. And you might think, well, wait a minute, Josh. If I, if I do really well in number one and I do lousy in number five, isn't that better? No. It's actually better to do mediocre straight through then kill number one and, and fail number five, right? I can show you the math if you want later. But it's better to give a mediocre answer throughout than really get a good number one. You can't recover the points that are lost. Consistently, the people get C's and D's in my exams are those who don't finish, without fail. Unless something horribly went wrong, the bottom of the curve, people don't finish. And what kills me is they do really well in the first couple questions, and they just leave stuff blank, and it's a zero. I can't give any partial credit for, for a blank answer. Or well, they write like one sentence at the very end until they just they wrote something and just they had nothing else to do. Okay. All right. Any questions on that generally? Bring a watch, not uh, not an Apple Watch. Please get a buy a cheap watch, five dollars. You can't bring an Apple Watch to the exam, uh, at least in this in this building. Uh, uh, just get a regular watch. You don't want to look at the clock because that gets nerve wracking. It's tick tick tick, right? Just put a watch next to your desk and you'll be much happier. Um, and that way, you don't have to worry about looking at the screen. OK. Any questions? All right. I don't want to see any of you leave stuff blank in the exam, but some of you will. I can't, I can't avoid it. All right. We are on our way to finishing future interests. Today is probably the most painful class. Uh, I'll be honest. It's probably, it's probably the hardest one. Uh, the one on Thursday is painful, but not as painful. But this one brings together a lot of things we've learned. There wasn't actually much new. If you notice, there were zero cases. I, I didn't even bother giving you the case. It would have been too much, right? You're welcome. Um, the, the, the cases in this topic are not helpful. I've taught them before. They don't actually help understand it, so I just skip them. I, I've tried it. They don't work. Um, but the, um, and I'm not doing a poll question today, uh, but the, um, the class today is going to be very long in terms of what we have to cover. So I want to start again by filling in our table 
which we will refer to in this class. Okay? So I'll start off the first row. This should be in your notes 100 times over, but I'm just going to do it again. For, uh, send it. A life is, uh, sorry, fee simple lasts forever. We write to A and his heirs, and the future interest belongs to A's heirs. Okay, that's fine. Easy. Okay. Now, with a life estate, there are really four different kinds of life estates we've talked about. Let me give you four different kinds. From O to A for life, to A for life, then to B and his heirs. Number three, to A for life, then to B and his heirs. Okay. Oh, no, let me modify that one, right? Uh, uh, let me make it this. To, to, uh, to A for life, then to B's children. I'll tell you B has one child. Okay? Sorry. And this one, to A for life, then to B's heirs. Okay, about that. All right? In each of these, we know the present interest. That's easy. The present interest is that A has a life estate. Last of life of A. That's the easy part. Okay? The harder part is figuring out the future interest. As a general rule, not always, but as a general rule, when you have a life estate, the future interest that comes right after the life estate is going to be called a remainder. Not always. There's some exceptions we might talk about later. But as a general rule, if you're not sure and you really have no idea what you're doing and you see a life estate, just think remainder. You're probably right 90% of the time, which is good enough for most people. The reason why is there's a natural termination point, right? A person dies. There's no doubt a person dies eventually. It happens sooner or later, but a person dies. Okay? Now, the first one is an instance where the future interest is not a remainder. Okay? So let's look at number one. What is the future interest in number one? Now, who am I up to? Who's next? Yeah, Cassidy. Oh, that's right. Is your mom here? Yeah, I, I told her it probably wasn't a good time for her to come. Okay. I think she might show up for like communal property or marital property. She can come whenever she wants. She's always welcome. All right. Well, I want her to come later. Okay. She gets... <laughs> All right. So, Cassidy, what's the future interest for number one right up here? From O to A for life, period. What's the future interest there? Well, first off, who has a future interest in number one? Oh, um. From O to A for life, who has a future interest? O. O has a future interest. Good. And what do we call that? Uh, uh, reversion. That's right. O has a reversion in fee simple. <coughs> right? And the reason why is when the future interest after life, it goes back to the grantor. It's not a remainder. It's called reversion. Most of the time, it's remainder. I said, if you have to guess, just guess remainder. But there are going to be some cases where it's not remainder, and that's the first one's reversion. Am I with me? Okay, this is nothing new. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Ash, I think you're next. Tell me, what is the future interest for number two over here? To A for life, then to B and his heirs. Very good. Okay. So we say that B has a remainder in fee simple. Do you want to be more precise? Um, what kind of remainder is it? See, this, this is where you start getting levels, right? You're not wrong. You're right. But that's like halfway there. Right. Let's be more precise. Vested. Why do you say vested? Who's ascertained? B, not the heirs. B. Are heirs ascertained while B is alive? No. That's right. But you, okay, but you're correct. This is specifically a vested remainder. 
right? And the reason why it's vested is because we have to ask ourselves two questions. First question, is B ascertained? Oh yeah, we've named him. If you're named, you're ascertained, that's the easy one. Is there some sort of condition precedent that is a condition that comes before B gets it? No, it happens immediately upon the death of A. Therefore, B has a vested remainder in fee simple. And I'm gonna nag, but add the fee simple at the end. That tells me you know what you're talking about, right? B has a vested remainder in fee simple. I know it's a mouthful, okay? But just say it out loud. Everyone with me? Questions on that one? Uh, Amir, I think you're next. Um, take a look at number three. I say that it's to A for life, then to B's children. And I'm telling you that B has one child living now. How would we characterize a future interest there? Very good. Nailed it. Perfect. Vested remainder, subject to open, and fee simple. Amir, remind us, what does that mean, vested remainder, subject to open? What does that mean? Because uh, B can have more children. That's right. Well, first off, why is it vested? Just, just because it has the children's ascertained. At least one child's ascertained. And what's the other part? It follows a natural death. There's no condition precedent. It follows naturally. So once A dies, B's kids get it. If there's only one child, he takes the entire lot. If there are two kids, they split in half, right? But the key point is this one is subject to open. So you have to ask yourself, right, what is, it the, what is the situation when this thing's drafted, right? There's one child alive. He's good. He's got it, right? It's his. If there are other kids, they come along and they share later. The class can open up further. It's subject to open. Yes, Cassidy. But it's not vested if there are no children. That's correct. If there are no children, what do you have? Then it would be contingent. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Well, you know what? Let me, let me just modify this one. I'll, I'll make it the one Cassidy just asked me like this, right? So I'll say, I'll ch I'm changing this on the board, okay? I'm going to say to A for life, then to B's children. And we say that B has no children. Right, that, that's the question Cassidy asked, and I think that's a, it's a good question, right? So Cam, how would we characterize these children? Right, what, what future interests do they have? Uh, Why is it contingent? They have to be no, 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 that, if I ask <laughs> contingent, they to, there are two questions. Okay. What are the two questions we ask ourselves? Uh, if there's an ascertainable person. Or is there an ascertainable person here? Uh, no. Why not? Yeah, they're not born yet. I, I know it sounds awkward. Well, they're not born yet. Go through the two questions, because if you skip those questions, you'll make, you'll make errors. So we say that B's children have a contingent remainder in fee simple. And the reason why is they're not ascertained. Okay, everyone with me. Let me try a fifth one for the for the chart. We had num I'm gonna add number five. This one's a little bit, little bit more messy. So, uh, Ricardo, you're on deck. From O to A for life, then to B and his heirs. If he graduates law school before A dies. Ooh, I that was a little messier, right? So let's go through this one step at a time, Ricardo. Right. For O to A for life, A is a life estate. That's easy, right? Okay. Then to B and his heirs, if he graduates law school before A dies. So just in plain English, how much time does B have to graduate law school? What's the, like the, the final point at which he doesn't matter anymore? When does he need to graduate law school by? Before A dies. That's right. <clears throat> B must graduate law school before A dies. And what happens if B flunks out, never graduates? What happens to Blackacre? Then gets to reversion to O. Okay, we're in business, right? So let's just go one level at a time. So Ricardo, how would you characterize B's future interest? Contingent Why is it contingent? Exactly, exactly. B has a contingent remainder in fee simple, okay, because it's subject to a condition precedent. 
Here in number four, the, the children were not ascertained. So that's one of the tests. And here flunks the other one. Oh, let me scroll a bit. I'm sorry. Because there's a condition precedent. What's a condition precedent? You must graduate law school before you get it, right? Precedent means before. One second. It has to happen before you get it. Yes, Alan? Uh, my question was, can it only address the remainder Yes, there's, there's no such thing as a contingent remainder subject to open. That's not a thing. Right. I, I know what you're asking. It makes sense, but we just don't use that phrase. But your, your question, I think, is a good one. Okay, and I think Ricardo said the other one, right? O as reversion, right? But let me just spell this out in a way that might seem a little odd. O has reversion subject to B's contingent remainder. Now, that's exactly what Ricardo said, but I'm just putting some sort of funny words on it, right? This is how we would say it in, like, the language. O has reversion, but it's subject to B's contingent remainder. If B goes ahead and graduates law school, O gets nothing. But if uh, uh, B fails, he flunks out, then O is reversion at the point of A's death. Because once A dies, it's too late. You can't go back to school. You can't retake classes. You're done. All right. One second. Go through each of these five cases. And this, I think, will give you the full scope of the life estate and the remainder or reversion as well. Yes, Nicholas. So for numbers three and four, Number four, could you say O has reversion subject to B's contingent? Yeah, I, that's exactly right. I didn't do it because I wanted to make a big flash with five, but it's the same for four, right? What happens if when A dies, there are no children? O, o has reversion subject to B's children's contingent remainder. I didn't want to do it there, but, but you're exactly right, Nick. Okay. Everyone just, uh, just so you can make sure you just type, I added this sentence right here, right? And number four, always reversion subject to B's children's contingent remainder. Because if B has no kids when A dies, black acres got to go somewhere. It goes back to O. And then for number three, if we assume... Okay, let me, let me just, everyone, everyone type that down. I want to make sure we get their notes are complete. Okay? All right, let's go up to number three. So for number three... We're assuming B is alive. If B yes. died, does that change it just to a vested remainder? If at the time this is there's a conveyance, right, and B's already dead, he has one child, that's good. But it's not subject to open, it's just vested by itself. Okay. That's right. Right, that's right. All right, everyone get these five scenarios of life estates and go through them, but you'll need to know if after life estate, maybe it's reversion but it's probably a remainder, right? I gave you five examples. There were five, I'm sorry, there were four remainders and one reversion. It's hard for me to give reversion. They're rarer. But you have to keep something in mind. Whenever you have a contingent remainder, there's gotta be a reversion somewhere or something else, right? You can't just stop with contingent remainder. You have to specify what happens if the condition doesn't satisfy. So if I ask you, what is the, you know, describe the present and future interest of Blackacre, and you see that there's a contingent remainder, you can't stop there. There's probably a reversion floating around, or it might be an executory interest or something else, right? But it's probably a reversion. Yeah, Kim? Once the, I guess, reversion takes place, that's the end of it. That's the end. It goes to O and his heirs. Yep. Period. That's right. Nothing else. Nope. Well, you can stack, look, Cam, you can stack a condition on a reversion, right? You can say he gets it for so long as, right? You can do whatever you want. So it, it's not over till you see a period. Let me put it that way, right? Yeah. No, remember I told you to read comma by comma? It ain't over till you get to the period. Well, I think it was number three, or like if B has children after A dies, O already has it because of whoa, whoa, the reversion. Well, if B has children after A dies, at that point, does it matter? It doesn't the, matter. Yeah. Right. B has to have kids while A's still alive. That's right. For this thing to make sense. I thought you asked if B has kids after he dies. And that, that's, no, no, no. that, look, you know, that, I suppose that can happen with in vitro and, you know, frozen stuff, but uh, that's generally not a common law that couldn't happen. There, there, there was a, there was a question once read, and it basically involved, oh God, rigor mortis. After you die, stuff still works. 
Um, and, and the question was, a person was impregnated after, look, th this happened. So there was, F person died, the, a woman was impregnated. I'll, 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 yeah, next question. <laughs> look, you, you asked. <laughs> you actually didn't ask that question. Uh, no, that was, that was me. That was me. That was me. I'm sorry. Okay, that, that's my, my twisted mind. But it, the, the funeral homes stuff happen. You know, no, but there's crime. No, no, I don't. I, it's no. Th there are actually people who are arrested. It, it's called necrophilia. Um, don't Google it. I'm done. Next question. Next question. I have no future interest in this class. I'm done. Um, I'm done. All right. Let's move on then. The next row. This table was like four pages long now. I told you this table just gets like, this is after this class's table, you, you never want to look at it ever again. But at least we'll do it for a little bit more. All right, so the fee simple determinable, right? From O to A, so long as black acre is used for school purposes. OK? This is our you know, classic example we've done 100 times. Uh, name text, sorry. No, I don't have it. Victor. Victor, okay, Victor, let me ask you a question. What is the future interest for this um, estate? It would be called the possibility of reverter. Say it again? Possibility of reverter. And who has it? Uh, o. That's right. So we say O has a possibility of reverter. Ah, oh, you read my mind. I was going to ask blank. That's right. Possibility of reverter in fee simple. Okay. Okay. O has possibly reverter and fee simple. And Victor, let me just finish it up with you. What happens as soon as the school is used for, say, residential purposes? What happens to the future interest? It goes to a, I mean, what do, any work have to be done? Any steps need to be taken? It's automatic, right? The the key factor, the fee simple determinable, with a possibly reverter, is it cuts automatically, right? It cuts off A's present interest automatically. No steps have to be taken. You don't have to go to court. Nothing needs to be done. <coughs> now, I want you to be very, t very close attention. The possibility of reverter is only used when it goes back to the grantor. Okay? You only call it a possibility of reverter when it goes back to the grantor. All right? I'm going to give you another example that might be different. So let's try this. I'm jumping down to the fee simple subject to an executory interest line. So I'm jumping. From O to A, so long as Blackacre is used for school purposes, otherwise to B. You see what I did there, right? It's the exact same durational language. So long as, so long as. It's the same language. But what's different? In this one, the future interest is going back to O. And we call this a possibility of reverter. But in this one, where does the future interest go? To a third party, B. Uh, 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 sorry, Nikki. Oh, I like that. It's like a paper bag or something. Yeah, I like it. It's good. OK, Nikki. What do you call the future interest in this case? What do you call the future interest here? And who has it? OK, that's correct. And, and executor interest, there you go. Very good. B has an executor interest in fee simple. Now, I want you to just look at this in your notes, just side by side. Look how close that language is, right? If you just see so long as, you, oh, man, I remember what you told me. So long as means fee simple determinable. And you don't go to the period, you don't go to the end of the sentence. You get it wrong. I forgot to put a period there. I'm sorry. I I'm doing this quickly. I always, I try to be careful with punctuation. You got to read to the period. Because the future interest goes to a third party, it's not going to be a possibility of reverter. Right? Right? It's not going to be a possibility of reverter. Now, let me make this point bluntly. Sometimes, to figure out the present interest, you have to do the future interest first. Like I said again, there are, there are going to be some cases where to figure out the present interest, you have to do the future interest first. 
which is backwards, right? So in this case, to figure out what the present interest is, you have to do the future interest first. So you would say in this one, I'll just put it here, A has a fee simple subject to B's executory interest. And in this one, A has a fee simple determinable, right? In order to figure out what A has, you have to figure out what B has, right? It, 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 it sort of twists your head, but you have to figure out what B has, and once you know what B has, you go back to A. Everyone just get that, right? You're going to have to jump back and forth, and it gets a little bit more messy later in class. Questions? Raise your hand if you have a question. I'd be happy to answer it. Is that clear? I don't think it's clear. I think it's messy. But uh, look, I've been teaching this for, for a number of years, and every year I have to like get myself back in the game to think how to do this clearly, because it's not straightforward. Yes, Vienna. Um, and my last question, why do we leave out? Because of the that. I don't think O has anything in these two questions. Where, where does O have any interest? I don't think so. I don't think O does. Well, O, o has a possibly reverter here. But in this one, O never gets it back. It's either going to A or B. It's never going back to O. So I think O is nothing. I think, I think at least in that question, that's right. All right, let me finish off the chart then, right? Let me finish off the chart. So we have um, here, for example, from O to A, N is heirs, comma, but if Blackacre is not used as a school, O has right of entry. Okay? And again, you see the words but if and you think, ah, that's going to be, uh, Dana, what does, what does a but if tell you? The but if language. Um, mm, you said it, right? You said condition precedent. You see what you did? See what you did? I'm not mad at you, but that's so easy to do it, right? It's fee simple, subject to condition subsequent. Subsequent, after. And you can tell this, right? How do you know this? Because the condition comes after the comma. From O to A and his heirs, comma. Condition comes afterwards, but if. That's a condition precedent. I'm, I did it. That's condition subsequent. I'm trying. It's, 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 it's hard. It's hard. Not your fault. My fault. That's condition subsequent. So we say that A has a fee simple subject to condition subsequent in fee simple. Okay, just to make your notes. Uh, Google, thank you. All right, in fee simple. All right. Now I want to just explain to you the difference between the condition precedent and subsequent. In this text, right? From O to A and his heirs, oh, I'm missing the word end, I'm sorry. From o, from o to A and his heirs, comma, but if. Right? Everyone see that the condition comes after the comma. Scroll back up. Okay? To this one, this last one. Number five. Look at number five. From O to A for life, comma, okay. Then to B and his heirs if he graduates law school before A dies. Right? There is no condition afterwards. Right? We read this clause. Then to be in his heirs if he graduates law school before A dies. Okay? Here the condition comes before. B does not get Blackacre until he graduates law school. In other words, first law school, then Blackacre. Do you see why this is a condition precedent? The condition, the condition comes before he gets it. This is a condition precedent. Okay. Now go back down to number uh, 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 to this this row. This is a condition subsequent. A gets it, and he keeps it until something happens later. And if later it's not used as a school, he loses it. Condition subsequent. Condition afterwards. One second. Do you see the difference between the two? Yes, uh, Mackenzie. I'll go back up. Okay, number five. All right. Um, 
N no, and I know, I know why you want to say that, because it's cutting it short. But here, what is the first estate? Okay, it begins with the life estate, right? When you have a natural termination, the estate that follows it is going to be the remainder or reversion. You have, that's your first rule, that's why I list it first, right? You want to say, oh, doesn't be of a life estate, I'm sorry, an executor entry is cutting it short. When you have a natural termination like a life estate, you're going to have either reversion or remainder afterwards. Okay? Now let's go back down to this one. Mackenzie, does this estate terminate naturally? From O to A and his heirs, but if Black Acre is not, is there any natural termination there? So this can't be a remainder reversion, it has to be an executory interest. And let me just finish off the row. Um, we say here that, that O has a right of entry in fee simple. And we know that because it tells you right there, right? You should be so lucky they give you this one in the exam because it tells you what the future interest is. It says O has right of entry, O has right of entry. You should be so lucky. They do it every other year. Maybe you get this, I don't know, right? But those are the easy ones. It's right in the damn thing. I, I can't give you a fee simple subject to condition subsequent without this phrase. Because if I don't give you this phrase, it'll be something else. I have to give you those words. Deanna, I think your hand was up? Oh, no. I saw a hand somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it seems redundant, but it, it, you have to say it. He has a fee simple, subject condition subsequent. Uh, yeah, no, you don't have to. I guess in that one you don't have to. Okay, but you, you can. Right, uh, yeah, Tim. There a moment of time where it's subject to O's right of entry. Uh, uh, A's uh, right of entry would be subject to O's right of entry. Um, you, you can say that, but generally you don't have to. I see what you're saying, but you don't have to say that. I'm not going to write the board because it confuse people even more. You thought we were done with this chart, didn't you? 30 minutes in, we're still not done with it. I got more. I'm sorry. We got a shift in spring in a minute. Yeah, Lisa. Sarah. For um, the fee simple subject to condition subsequent for the future interest, why do I feel like it's missing a word? Fee simple subject condition subsequent. What am I missing? Uh, for the future interest, because um, they say, but if Black Acre is not used first as a state, then O has a right of entry. And um, I don't know, do we, are we supposed to add like some kind of thing again? But the word but if is the contingency. I don't, think, I don't think I'm missing anything. O has a right of entry in fee simple. Yeah. Uh, look, look, I, if you want to, okay. This is kind of what Tim was asking, but I'll yeah, do it. Yeah, exactly. uh, I, this was, I think Tim, you asked about this a minute. Yeah, similar. Okay, so you can say O has a right of entry in fee simple, subject to A's, fee simple, subject to condition subsequent. Are you happy, Sarah? <laughs> Look, I, I didn't put it there somewhat deliberately, but if a student asks me, I'm not going to say no. You're right. You're, you're, you're right. I mean, but do you see your instinct? Your instinct was that correct. Compare. Look, I'll do it here. No, you don't have to. Oh, too late. <laughs> right? It's on the Google Docs. It's already shared. Yeah. I'm going to read to you in a second. I want to make sure I type this correctly. Um, I want to just explain what Sa Sarah asked a very good question, and she's exactly right. Okay? If you want to be super precise when you describe the future interest, you have to say what it's subject to. Right? This is what you're asking, right? So here we say that A has a fee simple subject condition subsequent. Okay? So basically, future interest. O is a right of entry in fee simple, subject to oh, I see. I A's fee simple subject condition subsequent. Okay? A is a fee simple subject to B's executory interest. B has an executory interest fee simple, subject to that. So it's not necessary. If you tell me what the present interest is and the future interest is, I got all I need to know. Okay. But if you want to do it in one fell swoop, you can do this, which I don't recommend. Because just just my God, subject to, subject to, subject to. The, the word sub, sub, I mean, you're going you're gonna to make a mistake. So the stuff in the parentheses, 
I don't expect you to write. I don't want you to write. I think you'll confuse yourself. I'm putting it there for your sake of completeness, but the stuff in parentheses, just understand it, but I don't want you to do it because you're going to make a mistake. There's just so, there's so many layers to these questions, but you're, you're thinking exactly on the right level. It's fine. No, you're, 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 you're thinking exactly correct. I have no, no objection. I'm not done. This chart will get bigger in a minute. Your brain hurts, right? I told you it was painful. I, I can't sugarcoat this class. Uh, this class hurts. I was getting ready this morning. Oh, it's going to be a long one. I had to send at least one email to the editor of the, ma the teacher manual to clarify something, which I think will be clear in the next edition. I'm not, I'm not going to mention it because it'll confuse you even more. But I found one thing that wasn't clear, and I'm not going to mention it. Books of the what, 14th edition? No, it was the 9th edition. There's still things that don't make sense. In the, anyway, everyone with me? OK. Let's do new, new stuff. This is all reviewed. Nothing here is new. OK. All right. Um, all right. So we have the final row in our table. Right? We have this final row in our table, which is the fee simple subject to an executory interest. And we described it here that B has an executory interest in fee simple. That is correct, but it can be better. And people are wincing. And there are two kinds of executory interests. There are two kinds of executory interests. There's what's known as the shifting executory interest and the springing executory interest. By the way, everyone knows where to find these documents, right? If you go to the syllabus, there's a link for a Google Drive folder, and they're all sequential. They're all numbered. So if you didn't copy this all down, it's all there for you to, to copy and paste in glory. There's no, there's no reason to have to copy everything down verbatim. I remember when I was, I think when I was a freshman in college, I used to take a digital camera, take a picture of the, of the screen, and type things up later because there were no notes. It wasn't available. Uh, so here, everything, I always want to make things available for you. All right. It was a large lecture. You didn't know what I was doing, but let's take a picture. Um, Shifting executory interest and springing executory interest. So let me give you the upshot first. There's no difference between the two of them. It makes no difference today whether it's shifting or springing. Right? Today under modern law, it makes no difference if it's shifting or springing. However, 500 years ago, it made a difference. Now, you're going to be very happy. I don't need you to know what happened in, before the statute of uses in 1536. You're welcome. I, I want you to understand, before 1536, the courts didn't like executory interest because they cut things up. And some of them were not valid. But today, they're valid. You can have both shifting and springing. So the labels are merely labels. Right? The labels are merely labels. It doesn't actually have any legal effect. But you need to be able to describe which is which. Okay. You need to be able to describe which is which. Everyone with me? Okay. How then do you distinguish a springing executory interest from a shifting executory interest? You have to look at whose interest is being cut short. Right? You have to look at whose interest is being cut short. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. 90% of the time, it's shifting. Springing is rare. right? The spring interests, they're rare. They just don't pop up as much. So if you have to guess and you're just not sure for the, for the, for the, for the exam, just guess shifting right? if you're not sure. Or leave it blank. right? But don't guess springing. Springing is probably not the right answer. Indeed, springing is easier to dissect, but it, it, it's more rare. Okay, so what's a shifting executory interest? <laughs> Excuse me. A shifting executory interest is an executory interest that cuts short. Not, yeah, I'm sorry. That cuts short an interest in a third party. A shifting executory interest 
is an executor interest that cuts short an interest in a third party. Let's go back up to this row right here. From O to A, so long as A, I'm sorry, so long as Blackacre is used for school purposes, otherwise to B. Okay? So let's just be very clear. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, Jenny. So many people, I can't see all the name tags. So Jenny, in this question, who is the grantor? Okay. Who is the grantee? That's right. O is the grantor. A is the grantee. Okay. And who's B? Third party. Okay. Who is B cutting short? Whose interest does B cut short? Who is B cutting short? O or A? Okay, that's correct. Okay. So let's just draw it out like this, right? O is the grantor. A is the grantee. What we call a third party. Okay? And B has the executory interest. Everyone see that, right? O is the grantor. A is the grantee. We call it the third party. And then B is the executory interest. B cuts short A's interest, right? B comes along and cuts short A's interest. When B cuts short A's interest, we call that a shifting executory interest. A shifting executory interest. Okay? So I'm going to add this in bold so you can see it. B has, oh, now it's an. Sorry. B has a shifting executory interest. How do you know that it's shifting? Because B is cutting short the interest of a third party. In this case, it's A. In almost every case, again, if you have to guess and you're just not sure, just guess shifting, you're probably right. The springings are a lot more rare. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, in past classes, you used the word transferee, another transferee instead. Yeah, transferee and grantee, they're synonymous. Yeah, they're synonymous. Okay. You'll see it both ways. I'm trying to do grantee because it's shorter. If you were, but, but grantee, transferee, it's the same thing. Right? Same exact phrase. But thank, thank you for keeping me consistent. I do. There are lots of words for the same thing, and I want to make sure I try and use the same words for everyone. All right, everyone see this, right? All right. In most cases, the executor interest is going to be shifting, because that's just what that's usually how they're drawn up. But I want to give you an example that you saw before that you didn't like very much. And you know which one I'm going to give you, right? So I'll call this number one. Just have your notes lined up. Number two, O conveys black acre to A for life, then to B if B gives A a proper, oh, this one, funeral. This is one of the hardest ones, I think, in the, in the, in the book. Okay. O conveys black acre to A for life, then to B, if B gives A a proper funeral. All right, so I think Blake, you're next. All right, so Blake, let's take this one step at a time, okay? So I told Mackenzie a minute before, a minute ago, that when you have a life state that terminates and a person dies and it goes to someone else, we call that a remainder, right? Does B have a remainder here? Does B get it upon the termination of A's life? Not immediately. Yes. Not immediately. I like the way you phrased that. What happens immediately upon the death of A in this case? 
What happens immediately upon the death of A? Have a reversion? Bingo. Everyone see this, right? So let's just let's, let's line it up. Right? A has a life estate, present interest. That much is easy. Blake, what does O have? Oh, is reversion. I'm not done yet, though. I'm going to just put blank, blank, blank here, right? Because we'll come back to O in a minute. So, Blake, let's finish this up. A is a life estate. O is reversion, blank, blank, blank. Right? What about B? What does B have? Why do you say that B has remainder. Oh. What's a remainder, Blake? What's the very definition of remainder? How do we define it? What did I tell Mackenzie two minutes ago? Okay, Stuart, you wanna what how do we characterize B's interest here? What is B's interest doing? What do you call something, right? Well, Stuart, let me start like this. Why do you think this is a remainder? Why do you think B has remainder? I know why you think it, but just say it out loud. It's being the remainder of the future interest. No, no, what is the definition of a remainder? How did I define it several times this class? What is a remainder? After? Okay. Does B get this after the life estate terminates? Does B get black acre after the life estate terminates? Yes, under the condition he gives a property to normal No. Wrong. Does he get it immediately upon the termination of the life estate? No. So, do we still call that a remainder? Marcos? Ah, oh, he's right. So just tell me, Marcos, you're right, but why is this not a remainder? Just explain this for the class, please. Because he has to meet the condition before he can. Yes. The remainder happens naturally upon death. Nothing has to be done. When a person dies, there's some period of time in which the funeral has to be planned. Okay? So again, that's correct. A, life estate, good. O is your version, blank, blank, blank. So Marcos, what does B have? B has what? Uh, you said a minute ago. An executory interest. Okay. B has an executory interest in fee simple. But you're not done yet, Marcos. How would we characterize this executory interest? And actually, I put this in the wrong column. Don't, 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 don't get mad at me. I put it in the wrong column. I'm sorry. It should be over here at the future interest column. I'm sorry. Okay. I just moved it from here to here. Marcos, how would we characterize this future interest? Subject to B. No, no. How do we characterize this executory interest? There are two kinds. Is this a shifting executory interest or a springing executory interest? It's a springing. Why is it springing? It's revesting the um, state of A. No. Who is getting cut oh. short? Oh. That's it. Look very carefully what's happening. A dies. O has reversion. O is holding on to it. When B holds the funeral, B cuts short O. B cuts short O. Right? The definition for spring executor interest is one that cuts short an interest of the grantor. And the grantor is almost always going to be O. Every question. All right. Again, A dies, O has it, perhaps forever. Right? But once the funeral is held, B comes along and executes. He cuts short O's interest. Therefore, B has a 
bringing executory interest, right? B has a springing executory interest. Why? Because B is cutting short O's reversion. Everyone see that? B is cutting short O's reversion. Now, if B dies and never gives a funeral, O has in fee simple forever. He's, 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 he's free and clear. So long as B is alive, I don't know, can you actually give a, funeral, a proper funeral many years later? I, I, it's not very important, but you have to wait. Now, uh, Delisa, let me ask you a follow-up question, please. I put blank, blank, blank here. Make Sarah happy, fill in this blank. Yeah, fill in this blank right over here. Oh, it's reversion. So close. Has reversion and fee simple subject to whose executory interest? B's. B's, and how would we describe it? Uh, That's it. Perfect. You see what I just did? I'll put, I'll put parentheses, right? But I want everyone to see this, right? We can't describe O's interest until we describe B's interest. See how we go backwards? That's with the blank, blank, blank there, right? In order to describe O's interest, we have to define B. So we say, ah, B has a springy interest. Therefore, O's reversion fee simple. That is subject to B's springing executory interest. And again, why is it springing? Because B is cutting short the interest of O the grantor. Let's walk through this one more time, just very, very, very closely, right? In number two, O is the grantor, right? O is the grantor. B cuts short the grantor's interest, therefore it's springing, executory interest. And then O is reversion, that's subject to B springing executory interest. You have to, it's almost like a dance. You have to go to the end of the line and come back and do a kind of a circle to figure out the entire question. You can't just start in the middle. You have to go step by step. Um, you're going to try and flow chart this for your outlines. Good luck. Uh, I've seen people try and do it. You can try. I think actually struggling to make the chart is more useful than actually having the chart, because it'll teach it to you. Right? So the end product, I think, is not very important, because it, it, it can't be done. I've tried it. it can't. Maybe it can, but I, I don't think it can be done. But you have to do this kind of circular dance. Start at the beginning, go to the end, and go back to the middle. I know you're lying. I know you have questions. This is this, this is incomprehensible. Yes, please, Lexi. Thank you. Uh, can you <laughs> just explain one more time why, in this situation, it's a reversion? Oh wait, no, sorry. It's an executory interest and not a remainder. Okay. The phrase remainder is only going to be used when it naturally follows the termination of a prior estate, which is almost always life estate. So if you have a life estate, you can have remainder after it. But here, there's a gap after the person dies and before the funeral, which means there's reversion. So it can't be remainder. Right? Again, if you're ever not sure, you have to say, well, the person dies. Is there even a minute that goes by before it goes to someone else? If there's any small gap of time, it's not going to be remainder. Remainder falls naturally upon death. Ditto for reversion, right? As soon as A dies, O has reversion. It's immediate. Nothing has to happen. O has reversion right away. There's no, there's no gap of time bef between A's death and O. It's instantaneous. Right? And, and this is a factor of history, right? There were no wills back then, right? You would say, I have it for my life, and when I die, my son or whatever, right? My wife, whoever it happens to be. It's automatic. You don't have to go to court to do anything. If, you, if anything has to happen, it can't be remained. It's got to be something else. Yes. So 
automatic because it goes back to oh, let me let me so it's, you don't have to go to court because it's automatic let, let, me, let me let me say this differently right you can have a condition precedent right go back to our example here with the law school example I think that was number uh, number five right from O to A for life then to B and his heirs if if he graduates law school before A dies, right? This is the example we gave earlier. If A graduates law school, it's automatic. If A flunks out and doesn't graduate, he gets nothing, right? But you will know at the minute of A's death whether that condition is true or false, right? You will know either he graduated law school or he flunked out. It can, be, it can only be one of the two. You don't just wait and see afterwards what happens. There's no gap. At A's death, Right? Either B gets it because he graduated, or O is the reversion. Either of those th th two things happen. There's no, th th there's no gap there that would suggest it's executory interest. Right? Uh, uh, B is not cutting anyone interest short. Questions? This is, it's not easy. I'll, I'll, I'll be candid. People, you know, reaching for like Advil right now, right? Uh, yes, Elias. Last class, you uh, were talking about how contingent remainder can be confused with Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah, I'll do some examples in a minute. Um, they're often very similar, and sometimes, sometimes there's a close call between them. All right, let's try an example. Um, go to page uh, 321 in your book, please. Okay, and we're going to do example eight. I think, uh, I, I th I think uh, Louisa, I think you're next. So um, you want to read example number eight, please? Okay, thank you so much. All right, I think this, this might go to Elias' question a little bit. Oh, wait, sorry, no, 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 you, I actually wanted you to stop, so you read my mind. You anticipated. Stop. Okay, thank you. All right, O conveys to A for life, then to B and her heirs. But if B does not survive A, to C and his heirs. All right, Louisa, so let's go one step at a time. A is a life estate. That's easy, right? Okay, so now what about B? How would we characterize B's future interest here? His future interest. Okay. So you're correct, but you're not all the way there. But so far, so good. So in this one, B has a remainder fee simple. You're, you're right. Okay? Now we have two kinds of remainders. What kind of remainders do we have? What are our two options? Vest in a contingent remainder. All right? So Louise explain to me, is this remainder vested or contingent and why? Um, contingent. Tell me why. Because uh, B is still alive, so your heirs um, are not ascertainable. Well then to B and her heirs. Right? It's not B's heirs. Right, yeah. So is B ascertained? Yeah. Okay, well there 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 are two elements though, right? So is B ascertained, number one? Is there a condition precedent? What about this but if language? Is that a condition precedent? Wait, where is the but if? After the comma. But if B is not for, is that a condition precedent for B? Oh, yeah. Oh, I played a trick on you. You were right the first time, and let me tell you why. Stop at the comma. All right, stop at the comma. So A for life, comma, then to B and her heirs, comma. If we just stop there, right? I, my hand's not that long. But if we just stop there, I'll highlight easier, right? If we just stop there, 
what's in highlight in blue. That's a vested remainder, easy, because B is ascertained and no condition precedent. Here's where it gets messy. But if B does not survive A, the land goes to C and is heirs. Giancarlo, let me ask you a question, please. What is C doing here? What's C's role in this entire picture? Right, waiting for what to happen. Yeah, yeah. So what does C really want to happen? Um, if you're C, what, do you, what, what are you rooting for? Who are you rooting for to die? Not for to die. No. If B does not survive A, then Who do you want to die first if you're C? C. You want B to die. You want to see that, right? If you are C, you are, you know, you're, you're rooting for B to die, you know, give him extra plating of, you know, barbecue, just give him extra food, you know. It's like... Oh, you don't need to exercise. You're fine. You look great, right? Um, if you're C, you want B to die first. Because if, if B dies first, John Carlin, what happens the minute that B dies? Then he has, it cuts B's interest. Right. So C cuts off B's interest. What do you call C's estate then? His future interests. Executive interest. Okay. So in this one, C has an executory interest. And just finish up, Giancarlo. Is it shifting or springing? It's shifting because it's a cutting off of the third party. Exactly. OK. C has a shifting executory interest in fee simple because C is cutting short B's interest. Once B dies, his heirs are screwed, right? Because they get nothing. Because B did not outlast A. But wait a minute. I thought, I thought, uh, b b b Adam, thank you. I thought that, I thought Louisa told me that. B as a vested remainder. Can you cut short a vested remainder? Can you cut short? Does that make it contingent? You can't. All right. One thing I don't like about this book is they teach you stuff in the examples without actually explaining it. So there's a phrase. And the answer is right here. I mean, you could just read it, right? B does not have a contingent remainder. This was Louise's question, right? You stop at the comma. There's no condition precedent, and he's ascertained. But there's a condition subsequent, right? There's a condition afterwards. So we say that B has a vested remainder in fee simple subject to divestment. Subject to divestment. And let me actually give you a better way of saying it. Sarah's not here, but I'll make, I'll make her happy, right? B as a vested remainder subject to C's shifting executive interest. Today, right? Subject to the idea, right, is you have a remainder that's vested because those two conditions are satisfied, but it can be cut short by C's executory interest. OK, everyone with me? Yes, uh, 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 Marissa. No, and that's, that's, that's so, I'm so glad you asked that. A vested remainder can be cut short, right? But it cannot be subject to condition precedent, right? The condition comes after. It comes after the comma. This is, this is so subtle. I'll, wait, I'll, I'll give you a second, I promise. Look at example eight, right? From O to A for life, comma, then to B and her heirs, comma. You stop at the comma. That's a vested remainder. B's ascertained. And there's no condition precedent. There might be a condition subsequent, but that's not our test. Our test is ascertained, number one. Number two, condition precedent. This is why I told you, you have to go through those two tests. You can't shortcut it. If you shortcut it, you get this question wrong. If you shortcut it, oh, it's a contingent remainder, and you get the question wrong, right? There's some questions where there's a close call. I don't think this one is. This one, I think, is actually easy. I think the book gives the answer exactly right. One second chance, right? 
this is going to be a vest remainder. But you can have a vest remainder that can be divested, cut short by the executory interest. Yeah, one and then chance next. Is subject to divestment the same thing as subject to open? Mm -mm. No, I almost spit out my water. No, 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 they're not. Uh, no, no. Subject to open means that there can be more children born into the class. So don't, don't, they're not the same. I almost spit out. I'm sorry. It was very close. Chance. Would it matter? It wouldn't matter because it would be These kids are irrelevant to this picture. Yes, that LeVay. And then the other side of that is it has to, the best remainder has to follow a life estate, right? There, it can't. Yes. Or, or, or something that terminates naturally, like a term of years, but it'll almost always be a life estate. Yeah, uh, over there. Is there a hand over there somewhere? No? Okay, I'll, I'll start lies. Over there. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. I actually prefer the second one you said. I would say, here, let me, l l let me just type it so that way everyone has their notes are clear. Um, I would say that, well, let me make sure I get the names right. B has a vested remainder subject to C's shifting executory interest. That's how I would, I mean, I, I like, subject to the investment is fine, but this is actually, I think, a little bit, more uh, uh, clear. The book, I, I think, is okay in that one, but I, you can be a little more precise. Caitlin. Um, so in the book, we're kind of in that zone question with that the subject to open, and then there's also something that they like compared to um, vested subject to partial divestment, and they kind of made it sound like, I mean, they just make sound like the same thing, and I get from what you said it wasn't, so what is Well, well, partial. Oh, God. Um, uh, par partial divestment. Uh, okay, so when you have a when you have a fee simple, I'm sorry. When you have a vested remainder subject to open, right? That means if you get brothers and sisters, they join the class, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you're an only child, and your parent dies, the only child. That's it. You're done, right? You get 100 percent of Black Acre. But let's say your 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 father and your mom have like you know quintuplets, right? You had a hundred percent interest. Guess what? Now you have a twenty percent interest, so you are partially divested. I think that's what the book uses. I don't use that phrase because I think it, it, you have enough damn terminology. But, but I think that's what the book's getting at. Okay, questions. All right. But the important point here is you don't know what B has till you see what C has. Right. Go back to the example number eight. Until you characterize C, you can't figure out B. It's a stance. You have to go kind of in a circle. Yes, Lice. Uh, your vested remainder does not say that the divestment is a particular And it's also not uh, subject to open. It could be to stop at. Vested remainder, fee simple, period. Yeah, you can have that. Right, I mean, that's. Let me go back to our table, right? Like this one, number two, all right? To A for life and to B and his heirs, vest remainder fee simple period. No, that's it. There's not. It's not subject to divestment or anything else. It's it's clean. Questions? If you're thinking about it, yeah, go for it. Yeah, let me let me let me tell you like this. You have to go comma by comma, right? I'll be really careful with the punctuation, but each clause between commas has to be treated by itself. Okay. Let's go actually back. Go to the previous page. Go to example number seven. I think it's on uh, three. Uh, it's on three twenty. Um, go, we'll just go back a page. I jumped that order a little bit deliberately, but we'll go back. All right. Uh, where am I, uh, Navin? You want to read uh, O conveys. Uh, o conveys to A for life, then to B and their heirs, B survives A, and if B does not survive A, to C and his heirs. Okay. Let's just, this actually, I think, gets to Alan's question a little bit. 
Um, okay, so I'll start you off, Navin. Uh, o conveys A to, to o, o conveys A for life. A is life, I say. Okay, that's easy. Okay, comma. Then to B and her heirs, if B survives A. How do we characterize B's future interests here? What, what's your, just talk out loud, what's your thinking of how to characterize B's future interests here? Well, first, I it's going to be, it's a third party, so it's definitely a remainder. And how do you know it's remainder of all the possible future interests? Why is this remainder? Um, it's following A's life, so it's following the natural. Okay, that's right. So it follows the termination of a life, so it's remainder. Now we ask ourselves, is this a vested remainder? Or is this a contingent remainder? What kind of remainder do we have here? <laughs> Just look at the language, right? To A for life, comma, then to B and her heirs, if B survives A, comma. How do we characterize B's remainder in this case? I think it's the vested remainder. Okay, what are our two questions, Navin? Because, um... Well, what are our two questions? If it has an ascertained... Okay, is B ascertained? Yes. Okay, what's the second question? And then is there a condition precedent? Is there a condition precedent here? No. Why do you say no? Is the condition before or after the comma? After. No. To A for life, comma, A is life estate. Mm -hmm. Next clause. Then to B in her heirs, if B survives A, comma. We're only looking at this to highlight in blue. Is the condition after the comma? Is it subsequent to the comma? Or is the condition before the comma, precedent? Precedent. So is there a condition precedent here? Yes. Is this remainder vested or contingent? Contingent. That's it. We're not done yet. You will come back. Uh, actually, with a chance. You had enough, right? Um, <laughs> good. Thank you. He's right. It took me a minute, but we, we got there, right? You have to look at the grammar. I know this sounds stupid, but you'll get the question right this way. I can't give you everything, but I can give you this. Um, the condition appears in the same clause before the comma. Then to B and her heirs if B survives A. Right? The if is right there. It's within the clause. And because the if is right there, that's called condition precedent. Condition precedent. And if you have a condition precedent, the remainder is contingent. It's not vested, it's contingent. I want to see why B has contingent remainder here. I want to see that. All right, Chance, let me call you the next one. All right, so we read after the comma. And if B does not survive A, to C and his heirs. What does C have here? That's what everyone wants to say. Right? Everyone wants to say he has an executory interest. That's not correct, though. Now, Chance, what happens? Let's just talk to that loud. Let's just talk in plain English, right? Let's say that B dies today. B is dead. And then A dies tomorrow. What happens to Blackacre? Is there any gap of time? between A's death and when C gets it? No. Is there any condition that has to happen first? Any sort of stuff that has to happen? B dying and A dying. B dies today, A dies tomorrow. Does C get it naturally? A dies, I'm sorry, B dies today, A dies tomorrow. What happens on Wednesday? What do you call a future interest that follows automatically after a life estate terminates? That's it. C has remainder. But you want to say executory interest, right? You just want to say it. That's why I did eight first, went back to seven. You want to say that C has executory interest. That's not correct. C has a remainder. Chance, finish it up. What kind of remainder does C have? What, 
What are our two criteria for remainders? What do we ask? Is there a condition precedent here? No. Or is he yes, right? But you see the brain, the brain freeze, right? There is a condition precedent there, right? The if is there, but it's still automatic, right? Let me say that one more time. We have two different things to think about at the same time. First, we ask, what is actually happening? You have a future interest that follows naturally upon A's death. Because if A is dead and B is already dead, it goes to C. That's going to be a remainder. That's step one. We characterize remainder. But once we have a remainder, we have to ask, is it vested or contingent? And then we see this word if up here. The word if is up there. And because the word if is up there, that's a condition precedent. And because it's a condition precedent, C has a contingent remainder. So let me just stack this together, right? A is a life estate. Here, let me, I'll, I'll type it down here so you can just see it. This is example seven. A has life estate. B has a contingent remainder. And C has a contingent remainder. Ready for it? Subject to B's contingent remainder. I know, I feel the same way, right? <coughs> With this one, you first characterize B's interest, and then you figure out what C has. But with example eight, you first have to do C, and then go back to B. So again, this is why flow charting this is insane. It, you, it, it's not going to work. But you have to conceptualize what's going on. Okay? You have to conceptualize what's going on, and then you have to look at the text, comma by comma. Oh, I got lots of questions. Yeah, Navin, Elias, or, or sorry, Ryan? Everyone. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, he was first. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. It's Naveen, by the way. But oh, Naveen, I'm sorry. I've been saying it wrong all semester. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good question, good question. Each, you know what a clause is, right? In, in the English language, a clause refers to the material between commas. So this sentence, I feel like it's Gloss Rock, right? There are three clauses. Clause number one, here, let me actually, the book has a highlight feature. Let's use colors. Clause one, clause two, clause three, okay? So clause one is in the blue, Clause two is in the yellow, and clause three is in pink. If you can't see colors, I'll explain to you later. I'm sorry. I've had colorblind students before. I have to, I, you know, it's, 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 I have to be sensitive to this thing. But um, blue is clause one, yellow is clause two, and pink is clause three. Okay. Clause one is where A's interest is defined. Clause two is where B's interest is defined, and clause three is where C's interest is defined. Right. When we're asking about B's interest, we're looking at clause two, and the condition comes within clause two, right? The condition for B is within the yellow. It's in clause two. That makes a condition precedent, right? The condition for clause three, for C, is within clause three. It's within the yellow text. If you want to just like on your exam, use different color highlighters, go for it. Maybe that'll help you better, right? But by separating each clause separately. Now let me go back to example number eight on the following page. And let me do the same thing for you, right? So you have clause one. I forgot what colors I use. Uh, clause two, I think I got blue, yellow, then pink. <coughs> okay? Clause one defines A's interest. Clause two defines B's interest. And clause three defines C's interest. Where does the condition appear? Not in clause two, which is B's interest. The condition appears in clause three, which is the interest of C. Does that? Okay, does the color, does that clarify things? 
this is actually, it's a grammar point where they know it's like people, a clause is separate. Now, Ryan was patiently waiting. I'm sorry to cut, I'm sorry to execute your comment before. <laughs> sorry. Okay, two questions. But yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's what the book calls it. I didn't get there yet, but that's exactly what the book calls it. Um, see this phrase here? Oh, I have maybe the highlighting is a good feature. Never used it before. Okay, <laughs> we have we have alternative contingent remainders. And let me let me. I'll get you a second. Um, someone had a hand there. I'll pause for a second. I'll give you a hint. Right, that that should help you. There are pairings. Right, pairings. This is not a 100% rule, but it's like a 90% rule, which is good enough for law students, right? You often have two consecutive future interests, okay? So in example seven, B's interest was contingent remainder. C's interest was contingent remainder, okay? Generally, not always, but generally, if the first one's contingent, the second one is also contingent. Okay? If the first one's contingent, the second one's contingent. These, we call these pairings, right? They generally link up like this. Not always. Again, you have to use your, 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 own, your own judgment on a, on, a, on a question. But if you're not sure and you figure out, oh, this first one's contingent, the second one's been contingent also. That's generally how it works. Okay? Then go to example number eight. Okay. B had a vested remainder that was subject to the divestment. Actually, let me just, just start there, right? Generally, if B has a vested remainder, then C has an executory interest. Or let me say this a little bit better. If C has an executory interest, then B has a vested remainder that's subject to divestment. All right, let me, let me just clarify this. Generally, with contingent remainders, you're going to do B first and C second. But with executory interest, you'll do C first and B second. It's flipped. And you don't know which is which until you actually understand the problem. By the way, this entire class is going to be two examples. We're almost done. I'm going to address everything else in a minute, but we're almost done, actually, with two examples, which is the, the hardest one in the entire book. Yeah, now, yeah, wise. I'm sorry, I, I executed your question. What, the second one? Uh, the second one is. So, you, you said it was taking that much time. That was, I knew it wasn't right. Oh, yeah. Was, anyways, uh, the other one was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's go back to it. So go back to number seven. Okay. There's usually, but in this case, uh, I don't think there is in this one, right? Because O can be A for life, then to B and her heirs, if B survives A. And if B does not survive A, to C and his heirs. Even if C is dead, C's heirs take it. I think, I, I think, I think it is in this case. Right, because C is alive, he had heirs, you know. Uh, it's, in other words, if C dies beforehand, his heirs are ascertained. I think the heirs of Susan would, would take it. So I don't think there's a version in this question. Elias, did your hand was up? Yeah, I, uh, on, on the exam, you were like explaining what interest B and C had. Uh huh. Would you say B has a contingent remainder to stop, or would you say B has a contingent remainder since they're subject to condition substitution? Um, you would say something like this B has a contingent remainder. In fee simple, subject to B's contingent remainder in fee simple. If you want to be the full, you know, go the full nine yards, you'd have to spell it out like that. No. Um, uh, I, I don't. No, I don't think you'd have to say that. I think you just stop there. Contingent remainder, fee simple. I think it's all you need. I saw another hand floating somewhere over there. All right, so let me give you an overview of the rest of the topic. Um, I actually, I had planned to do only these two questions. So I actually planned to get through, and I knew it would take me 90 minutes, so it's actually Ryan's schedule. Um, I want you to be very carefully go through this table. 
after today's class and make sure you understand every rung. If you don't, I'll be here till 7. You're welcome to stop by and ask me whatever questions you want. Um, the rest of the chapter are stuff that I don't really care if you know. Um, all the stuff in the statute of uses, you need to know for background, but I don't, I don't even ever test it on what the statute of uses is. I won't give you a question before 1536. If I do, that's, I'm not looking for that, so don't, don't worry about 1536. Um, the discussion on uses and benefits, don't worry about that either. You'll do this in trust and estates. It's not a very important point for this class. What I do need you to know, though, from this class are the differences between shifting and the springing executory interests. Right? That's the first thing I need you to know, the difference in the shifting and the springing executory interests. Um, the second thing that I need you to know are these pairings, and at least to understand what I'm talking about here. That if you figure out the first interest of B is contingent, the condition, I'm sorry, the interest of C is also contingent. And if you figure out I that the C has an executory interest, then B has a vested remainder subject to divestment of some sort, or subject to an executory interest. Okay? Those are the major takeaways they'd like for you to actually go through. Um, for review, um, there are some questions in the book that are good. Uh, so if you want to write these ones down, on, on uh, page 332, um, examples 14 is good, 15 is good, uh, 16 is good, uh, and 17. So 14 through 17 are good questions you should, should, you should look at. Okay. Um, there are also problems on page 334. And these problems have the answers in the back. If you go to page 334, there are a bunch of review problems. They're very good. And the reason why I like these is they give you the answers in some detail. Um, I'd like you to do number one, two, and three. You can sk skip the rest of them, but at least try and do one, two, and three. If you want to come talk to me later, I'd be happy to, to chat. Um, but those are very good review questions. Um, the only way to understand this is by review. Um, I'm going to ask Kendra, your Langdell, uh, to uh, go over the ones I just mentioned. Um, I'm sorry, Kendra's my Langdell for property too. In fact, that's Kendra's friend right there. She, Kendra's my property to Langdell. I'm sorry, I had a, had a brain slip. Um, Austin. I'll ask Austin to go over uh, 14 through 17 um, and, and, and the problems 1 through 3 at the next Langdell. If you want to come talk to me also, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but you have to do these. You can't just, you know, watch a video or read a horn book or, or like, you know, look at a commercial outline. You have to suffer through these, right? There's no shortcut to figure out the sequencing. Uh, and if you want to make a flow chart for your notes, try. It's going to be like you know, spaghetti. It's going to be over the place, right? It's, it's, going, to, it's going to look messy. But I, I, I encourage you to do it because actually making the chart helps. OK. Uh, I'll be in my office if you have any other questions. Otherwise, I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you so much.